Trump, and he is at third place in a new national poll. He received a warm welcome in Iowa this weekend. Joining me now is GOP presidential candidate, the entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, sir, thanks very much for being on the program this morning. It's good to see you, Casey. So you had one of the most enthusiastic welcomes at this major event over the weekend in Iowa. Um, but in this national poll, Donald Trump, the former president, still has 54 percent of Republicans supporting him. And you are in third place, yes, but you only have 5 percent. Um, Trump is on at the attack of many of the others in the field, um, but almost no one seems to be attacking him. How are you going to beat him? How are you going to catch up? Well, I started at 0.0% in March. I'm now at an unambiguous third in this race, and we're just getting warmed up ahead of the first debate stage. The thing about me is I'm not attacking any of my fellow candidates. I am not running against them. I am running for this country. And that's what I see on the ground in Iowa and elsewhere. People are hungry for an actual affirmative vision. Not what are we running from? What are we running to? I'm leading us to our American dream, sure, to but, our national but identity. So far they, and I think we need to move forward rather than retroactively looking at grievance. Well, sure. I, I mean, I take your point. Um, but you've also said in a recent interview, um, this caught my eye, that, quote, I'm quoting you here, the reality is about 30 percent of this country suffers from psychiatric illness when Trump is in the White House. People start to disagree with policies they otherwise would have agreed with just because he's the one advancing them. This seems to suggest that, you know, first of all, you see some issues with Donald Trump, but it also suggests that you believe that Donald Trump would lose the general election. Is that what you think? So, first of all, I'm not laying blame at anybody's feet, but I do think it is a fact that people in this country from 2016 to 2020, some of them even now, some of them even in the Republican primary, start adopting views that they would not have adopted if Donald Trump had not been the person advancing them. For my part, I stand for the America First agenda. I believe I will be able to take that agenda even further than Trump did, because I'm not yet having that effect on people. Do I think Trump can beat Biden in a general election in a narrow margin? To be honest, yes, I do. But I think I am the only candidate in this race, in the entire Republican primary field, who can deliver a Ronald Reagan 1980-style landslide election, a moral mandate in this election. And I think that is critically important to unite this country and, frankly, to drive forward the agenda that I have to shut down the administrative state, to declare independence from China. These are big steps that I want but to if, take as the next president. If, and that's going to take a moral mandate to do it. If you are running as I mean, in many argue you are running to the right of Donald Trump or at least trying to say you're Trump 2.0, you're perhaps Trumpier than Trump. How is it that the number of people that would suffer from a psychiatric illness isn't more than 30 percent for you. I mean, how, how on earth do you argue that you are the candidate that can get more voters than Donald Trump when you are essentially saying to people, I'm going to be more than he was? Because that presumes that policy disagreements are actually what drove it. I think it was a separate psychosis that relates to, fr frankly, the media's relationship with that individual. I've traveled to places like the south side of Chicago, Kensington, in the middle of Philadelphia on this campaign, places where traditional Republicans don't go. I find widespread support for policies like my plan to use the U.S. military to seal the southern border, frankly, to grow the economy, something that we haven't done in a very long time, no longer paying single women more not to have a man in the house than to have a dual parent household. We actually find okay. unity that goes beyond party lines. And I don't think the real division is between re Democrats and Republicans. I think it is between those who are pro-American and those who are anti-American. That's 80-20. That's a landslide election. And that's what I intend to deliver. So let me ask you a little bit more about the others in the field besides uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak, Donald Trump. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is defending some new state educational standards that include the idea, and I'm quoting here, slaves developed skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. But Senator Tim Scott points out, quote, there's no silver lining in slavery. I want to, you to watch what he says, and then we'll talk about it. What slavery was, was really about separating families, about mutilating humans, and even raping their wives. It was just devastating. So I would hope that every person in our country, and certainly running for president, would appreciate that. 
Are you with Governor Ron DeSantis or Senator Tim Scott on this issue, sir? The reality is I don't trust the media's filtering of what was in that curriculum, so I'd really want to read it in detail and understand what exactly was being taught. But I will say this, is I don't think that the division should be, are you with the state of Florida, which was Governor DeSantis' response, or the other side? I don't see it that way. I stand on the side of truth. Obviously, we should be teaching kids about the awful legacy of slavery, but even more importantly, we're not teaching them enough about the ideals that actually do define this country. Personally, I think the deeper problem in our schools today is many of them teaching young black kids, students and minorities, that they're oppressed based on the color of their skin or their genetic attributes. That's the real psychological slavery in the present, and that's what I have the biggest problem with. But I do think that some of these issues and these spats can be distractions from what should Governor DeSantis or Tim Scott or myself or others actually be debating. How do we grow an economy? How do we actually lift all people up, revive self-confidence and pride in the next generation of Americans? That's what I think we need to be focused on. All right, I, I'm going to move on here. I, I do think it is, it is worth underscoring that these criticisms have not come, that we're quoting here, have not come from the media. They have come from African Americans in the Republican Party, Senator Tim Scott, Congressman uh, John James. But let's move on now to uh, federal prosecutors added new obstruction of justice charges against uh, former President Donald Trump on Thursday. The indictment, the superseding indictment, says that after Trump learned that the Justice Department wanted to subpoena security footage from Mar-a-Lago, Trump talked with an aide who later told the IT director at Mar-a-Lago that, quote, the boss, and quote, wanted the footage deleted. Now, I know you've said repeatedly that you would pardon Trump in this document's case, but this is significant new information. So given this new information, do you still, would you still pardon him if you were president? The standard I use as our next president is what moves our country forward. What is the right thing for the United States of America? Right, and would and having a president like this move the right answer is to move on, and I would pardon him. I would, I, I'm, I'm, I intend to be our next president, and yes, I do believe I will move us forward. And yes, I think one of the right ways to do that is to pardon the former president of the United States from what is clearly a politicized prosecution. And I'll share a view with you, Casey. This is not specific to Trump. This is part of my broader view on the justice system in our country. I think that our general norm in our Justice Department is you should not convict somebody of a process crime when there was no actual underlying crime. I think that's a major problem. So you problem. think destroying evidence is a process the, crime? I think it is, by definition, a process crime. No, nobody left, right, any legal scholar will agree with me on that statement. That is, by definition, a process crime a crime that would not have existed but for the existence of an investigation. And if we look ourselves okay. in the mirror over the last several years, even look at the acquittals in the Gretchen Whitmer case, the fact that two people were acquitted of entrapment, I think it is a bad habit that our FBI and DOJ have gotten into intervening and creating crimes that would not have existed but for their action. And I think as it relates to moving forward as a country, I absolutely think the right answer for the country is to put the grievances of the past behind us, to pardon President Trump, so that we can move forward as one nation rather than marching to a national divorce. All right, Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you very much uh, for taking some time to be with us this weekend. I'm sure we're going to hear much more from you on the campaign trail. Thank you, Casey. My next guest is criticizing his fellow Republicans for tiptoeing around Trump. GOP Chris candidate Chris Christie joins me live coming up next. And then a potential challenge to President Biden from his own party? That's coming up. 